Let's step back and look beyond Obama and this election, although I want to begin by paraphrasing Obama and say, Charles, you didn't write this book. Someone else did. <laughs> um, what prompts that question is uh, this observation, that, that over the last decade or two, more and more conservatives, such as uh, popular figures like Glenn Beck, uh, scholars like uh, yourself and R.J. Pastrito, and, and others, especially in the Claremont Institute orbit, have come to appreciate how significant the progressive turn was in bringing us to the point that we have gotten to. But this was neglected by conservatives for a very long time. You know, our, our pal Jonah Goldberg went and did a search of the archives of National Review, discovered there was barely any mention of the progressive era or Woodrow Wilson or John Dewey for the first 25 years of the magazine, and not much after that. So uh, how do you explain why this has happened? Why have we, the last uh, couple of decades, taken up this focus on progressivism that was missing in the conservative movement before this time? Well, we, we tried everything else. Uh, <laughs> I mean, when I said that uh, you know, American politics didn't know what hit it, um, I think you can really see that in the conservative movement. I mean, as a, as a self-conscious intellectual movement, conservatism you know, appears quite late on the scene of 20th century politics. National Review is founded in 1955, after Wilson, after FDR, uh, and just on the cusp of the 60s and, the, and the, the next wave of liberal reform in the great society. Um, and conservatism didn't really have tremendous, undeniable political victories until 1980, when Reagan was elected, and 1994, when the Gingrich Revolution swept control of the House for the first time back into Republican hands after 40 years of Democratic dominance. The House had never been in the control of one party for such a long time in American history prior to that. Uh, and so 1980, 1994, at the end of the 20th century, basically, before conservatism um, uh, is able to hold the reins of power at the national level. Um, and how did conservatism in its wilderness years understand its enemy? How do they understand what they were trying to deal with? And you, if you look at the history of of, of the conservative movement, you find a great deal of, of um, very uh, uh, penetrating theorizing, but with almost no practical connection to political reality. Ah. And so you have the traditionalist wing of conservatism, which was looking at the French Revolution as the source of our problems, you know, and, and Rousseau and Robespierre. And so uh, we are on the side of the ancien regime. Right, none of somehow. whom are on the New York City Council. Yes, that's right, right. That's right. Yeah. And you know, there's some truth in that analysis. I mean, there is some connection between Rousseau and the progressives and so forth. But but imagining that that we had to um, recreate or find an old regime in our politics um, that was the analog to the old regime in France was a, a, a nonsensical. Uh, and non-starting political idea. Sort of a mirror, a mirror image of the Marxist mistake. Yes, and there are other kinds of conservatives who thought that the problem was industrialization right. and that we needed to get back to a more agrarian uh, economy or that we needed, uh, you know, excessive individualism had to be countered by communitarianism of a kind of uh, little platoons sort. And again, there is, there is some moral uh, uh, truth in each of these accounts, but it doesn't recognize the obvious fact which is the first political movement to attack the founding as obsolete and to offer a, a, a vision of infinite progress uh, and infinite growth of government without any harmful consequences to personal liberty or equality is liberalism uh, or is progressivism and later, as it called itself, liberalism. Well, now let me pose a special challenge for those of us who might be considered disciples of the Claremont School or the Claremont traditions. Um, just use a specific example. So one of the reasons for the careful study of the Federalist Papers uh, is to understand some of the subtleties of Republican self-government. Uh, it may be based on self-evident truth, but how it operates is not self-evident yes. or obvious or simple, right? Uh, and so in some ways, the subtleties of Republican self-government are a little bit like Christian faith. They involve some paradox at times. Certainly that's one way of reading Federalist Paper number 10. Mm -hmm. Now, any citizen watching this last paragraph is going to wonder what the hell 
we're talking about, right? <laughs> um, and the point is, is that the rich subtlety of the founders sits uneasily with the modern world of retail politics. And maybe all along it was difficult, but now it's even more so. So the question is, how would you translate the, sort of the intellectual substance of this book and the broader enterprise it's connected to uh, into usable, popular form? Now, I mean, we could, I suppose, uh, give a heart attack to Brian Kennedy and Tom Klingenstein by saying, let's send the Claremont Review of Books to every household in America. I'm not sure how effective that would be, right? We understand that maybe should we just all write stump speeches for Paul Ryan and other politicians who get it, which forces people to talk in the vernacular of the general public? Or how would you answer a, a broad, challenging question like that? Well, <laughs> I think um, it's really such a revival is indispensable um, to American political health. And the sooner conservatives understand that, and they do understand it increasingly, I think, uh, the better. Take, for example, the, the thorny problem of um, the welfare state and the impending bankruptcy of the welfare state. Uh, now, it seems to me that, uh, as uh, Tom Klingenstein was saying, uh, it's important to attack something like Obamacare or other iterations of it uh, as being too expensive, as being too bureaucratic, as being destructive of the best healthcare system in the world. Uh, it's also important to point out, though, that it is destructive of freedom, equality, and self-government. And, uh, and in many respects, that means of the constitutional forms that protect freedom, equality, and self-government. So I think one, for example, one way conservatives should think, could think about um, that issue is to distinguish between those parts of the welfare state that do harm to the Constitution, its structure, and to our freedom, equality, and self-government from those that do less harm to it. So for example, Social Security, I think, um, does much less harm to self-government in America than Medicare, Medicaid, or Obamacare would do. Because Social Security is essentially cutting checks. Uh, the government doesn't try to tell people how to spend their Social Security check. And, uh, you know, we could debate the abstract, um, uh, um, you know, the, the, the propriety of having Social Security. But if you're going to have it, it's, uh, it does less damage constitutionally than programs that try to micromanage society and the economy from the center. Uh, and these programs like Medicare, which, can tell, which wants to tell a doctor what he can charge, what procedures are covered and what are not, and you have to get permission for them, and Obamacare, which will be like much worse uh, and more stinting um, than Medicare or even Medicaid uh, today, will simply multiply, multiply the problems of Americans who find themselves um, at the bottom of a very steep bureaucratic pyramid. Uh, crushing their uh, equality, freedom, and capacity to govern themselves. And so those kinds of programs should be top priority for reform. Uh, or f and reform ought to be guided, it seems to me, by the notion that you want to make them less constitutionally offensive. Great. Let me ask you um, sort of two particular problems of current discourse that bear on this. Uh, and one is, is um, looking again at the precursor to Obama being Hillary Clinton, who in 2008 said, I'm not a liberal, I'm a progressive. Now, people who pay attention know this was just a longer syllable word for the same thing. But a lot of people, I think, uh, I think this is a shrewd and simple move for the, the very obvious reason that everyone's for progress. Who except a crank is against progress? So it, it's very clever. So how, how should conservatives confront this rhetorical term? How should conservatives think about and talk about progress? Well, uh, liberals are abandoning the term liberalism because they've ruined it. <laughs> right. um, it's now a political liability. Uh, and it means uh, or it implies a certain kind of weakness in foreign policy and indiscipline at home and so forth. Um, and progressivism, as you rightly say, progress in general is a good word. I mean, we want things to get better. Uh, and there's nothing wrong with conservatives um, appreciating progress in its proper dimensions and its proper sphere. You can measure progress if you have some kind of fixed goal or end. You can tell you're approaching it or receding from it. 
if the goalposts themselves are moving constantly, then you can't really have progress. And that's the position that liberalism now finds itself in. They're moving the goalposts. I mean, that's what, as what I talked about earlier is value relativism means. You can't really say what the end is or what good values are. You just sort of you continue the process for the sake of the process. Uh, and so there's, uh, there's nothing wrong with technological progress, with scientific progress, economic progress. Uh, but you have to know what you're measuring these by, some objective account of what's out there. And very importantly, I think, you have to recognize that moral and political progress do not go hand in hand with technological right. progress. You know, maybe what we ought to do is uh, stage an NFL football game re-envisioned by the rules of progress. So the goalposts are moved <laughs> after the field goal's been kicked in the air. Yes, right, exactly. This, this spares some thought. Yeah. Uh, related question, and that is rights. Liberals like to say that health care ought to be a fundamental human right. And it seems to me conservatives don't do a very good job of contesting uh, this sort of flabby way of thinking about rights. Uh, how, how do you think they should do it? Um, well, this goes back to your previous question about how, do you, how to energize the populace, I mean, ordinary citizens, on, on, uh, you know, in, a, in, in a sound way, given that these problems are complicated and that the ideas involved are not always straightforward. Um, it seems to me you, you have to begin by um, questioning what is a right. What's the difference between a right and a good? No one would argue that decent housing that um, are bad things. Old right. age, yeah. uh, you know, um, insurance or, or you know, a, a well-lived old age and so forth are bad things. They are good things, but are they rights? Um, a right implies necessarily a reciprocal duty. So if someone has a right to health care, there must be a duty for someone, someone else, else to, to pay for it. Right. That health care, and you can't have so you can't have the across? one without the other. Right. And so when you uh, when the argument of liberalism has been, since FDR at least, that the more power you give government, the more rights it will give you. Right. And so what is there to fear about big government? The stronger it becomes, the more programs it creates and the more rights you benefit from. That leaves out the duties. Right. I mean, you're not only paying for these things through taxes, uh, you're also uh, living with the unintended or mostly unintended consequences of them for your self-respect, for your sense of, of um, independence and e equality right. um, and, uh, and liberty. And so, you know, I think we should concede that, that these things are what they are. They are, they are goods. And government, pro government policy has a role to play, perhaps, in delivering many of these goods, probably more at the local and state level than at the national uh, level, or at least encouraging, you know, uh, opportunity so that these goods can be um, acquired by individuals and families. But you have to make some um, stark intellectual contrasts in order, I mean, in a way, the simpler you make the contrast, the more uh, powerful it is, and, and people deserve to be talked uh, to as adults who can understand that government is not simply a conduit for endless goods to be supplied to people because they say they need them. Or want them in the case of, yes, right. right. Well, uh, what I take away from our conversation and from reading your book is that we have a lot of work to do. Work usually begins with homework, <laughs> and I hope everyone will do their homework and read your book. Congratulations. Thank you very much.